So we will uh, continue on the third verse of Shik Shastikam today. And um, yesterday we spoke about humility. Today we'll take questions on humility and we'll also talk about tolerance today. Tolerance is a wide topic. It's quite extensive. And we'll try to cover what we can cover within the time. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Jaya 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 Sri Saitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhaktarinda Jaya Jaya Sri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jaya Jaya Dvaita Chandra Jaya Gaur Bhaktarinda Trinadapi Sunitchena Tayor Iva Suhishnuna Amanina Manadena Kirtaniya Sadarahi one who thinks himself lower than the grass, who is more tolerant than the tree, who does not expect personal honor, but is always prepared to give all respects to others, can very easily always chant the holy name of the Lord. Again, the four points that are being made, which are characteristics of one who is practicing on the platform or aspiring to reach the platform of Nishta. As we mentioned, the uh, nine stages of bhakti correspond with the eight verses of uh, six Sastikam prayers. Just a quick review. The first verse is Adhaustrata Sadhu Sangha Vajana Kriya. The second verse is Anartha Nivriti. This verse is Nishta. Fourth verse is Ruchi, the fifth verse is Akshakti. Uh, the sixth verse is, um, is Bhava, and the seventh and eighth verse are Prema. <laughs> so uh, we're actually cultivating or trying to enter deeper into the mood of a Vaishnava. And these this verse is mentioned by Srila Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami in Chaitanya Charitamrita in chapter 7 of Adi Lila, where he explains that uh, this verse is the ornament of a Vaishnava. And he uses very poetic language in describing that a devotee should take this verse and string it on the necklace of one's holy name and wear it as one's ornament. So this is a characteristic of a Vaishnava. Well, now to come to the stage, as mentioned here, is a process of cultivating the process of bhakti under the guidance of the spiritual master and simultaneously cultivating these qualities along with that. Humility, tolerance, pridelessness, and respect for others, which leads to continuous chanting. Okay, so here we got the ornament of a devotee, the characteristics of a devotee. This verse really can, helps us to become, what we say, nicely fixed in devotional service. Along with the process of executing our service, these qualities make that service simple, easy, wonderful, and continuous. Mm -hmm. And the word continuous, I think, is one of the One is not interrupted in the, in the execution of one's devotional service if one is cultivating these qualities. As we mentioned, nishta means firm faith or fixed, not deviated. So in order to continue nicely in our devotional service, these qualities are the elixir, or you might say the catalyst 
for bringing about that continuous devotional service. And they're also the characteristics of one who is on the spiritual platform. <laughs> okay, so we'll talk a little bit about humility. There's two kinds of humility, at least two, two ways that humility is, is uh, explained in the Shastra. I'm sorry, two, two ways that tolerance is explained in the Shastra. And one is from the Bhagavad Gita, um, can you put up Bhagavad Gita verse number 214? And we'll explore this verse a little bit. Two fourteen Bhagavad Gita. Marta sparses to Kongeyam, Sipnusha to Kadukada, Agapayeno Nityas Tams to Tiksava, Bharata. O son of Kunti, the non parent appearance of happiness and distress. And their disappearance in due course of time are like the appearance and disappearance of the winter and summer seasons. They rise from sense perception or ski and a bart, and one must learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. So this is one type of tolerance, the tolerance that comes by way of the external environment. When the external environment throws, it's what we say forms of distress at you. Um, so it's mentioned here that it's compared to the changing of the seasons, just like happiness comes and happiness goes. I mean, just like winter comes and winter goes, summer comes and summer goes. We're in the winter season now, so we got the heat on, we got extra clothes, we're not able to, what we say, stay outside for too long. And uh, so we're looking for ways to counteract that uh, misery caused by the winter season, discomfort. And then after some time, a few months from now, and then it'll be too hot, the fans will be running and we'll have the windows open and uh, we'll complain about the heat. Well, yeah, so this is, uh, winter and summer seasons, they come and they go and they come again and then they continue to move in that cycle. So in the same way, happiness comes, distress comes. So here, Krishna is saying, it's all due to the sense perception. In other words, it's based on how the body and mind are accepting it. Some For some people, they like the cold and some people like the hot. So it's all based on sense perception. So the changing of the environment in different forms are simply our mental, uh, our mental uh, development of what is good and what is not good, or what is pleasant, what is unpleasant, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. So here, Krishna says, tolerate him, that's all. <laughs> he makes it clear. Don't become disturbed by the changing of the happiness and distress. Comes and goes, don't worry about it. Just tolerate it. Okay, what can you do? And then, let's go to another verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is the second type of tolerance that is being explained. Tenth Canto. 14th chapter, 10th canto, 14th chapter, uh, text number 8, mm -hmm. 10, 14, 8. Very good, thank you. Pate nukampam shushamikshamano bhujana eva pritam vipakam vidvalva hubir vidadana maste. 
Jiveti yo mukti padesha dayabak. My dear Lord, one who earnestly waits for you to bestow their causes mercy upon him, all the while patiently suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds and offering you respectful obeisances with his heart, words, and my body, is surely eligible for liberation because it has become his rightful claim. So here, Krishna is arranging for the, the living entity to get some difficulty in order for them to purify. And the devotee doesn't, doesn't uh, complain. He understands what I've done in the past. This is what I'm getting now, my reactions of my past misdeeds. And actually, because Krishna is so kind, Krishna is very merciful, Krishna is minimizing the reactions that I should have gotten. I actually have should have gotten something much worse, but because Krishna is so kind, he's only given me a small portion of what I actually deserve. Therefore, it says here, one offers respectful obeisances in the heart, in his heart, words, body, mind. And then what is that? That person becomes uh, able to free themselves from the cycle of birth and death. The kingdom of God becomes his rightful claim. As Prabhupada right, not Prabhupada, this is not Prabhupada, this is the, the disciples of Bhakti Vedanta who continued to Prabhupada's purports is the purpose of the entire creation of God is to rectify the living entity's tendency to enjoy without the Lord and therefore the particular punishment given for a sinful activity is specially designed to curtail the mentality that produced the activity. Although a devotee has surrendered to the Lord in devotional service until he is completely perfect in Krishna consciousness, he may maintain a slight inclination to enjoy the false happiness in this world. Therefore, the Lord creates a particular situation to eradicate this remaining enjoying spirit. So it's done by the Lord himself as a way to bring the devotee to a higher state of spiritual awareness. Here it's mentioned, and this is very important, this unhappiness that is suffered by the sincere devotee is not technically a karmic reaction. It is rather the Lord's special mercy for inducing his devotee to, com to completely let go of the material world and return home back to Godhead. So this is another type of tolerance that the Lord is arranging and the devotee is seeing, oh, I'm getting some purification, something that I deserve. The mercy of the Lord is coming in this form of this because of my attachment to sense gratification because of my, what we say, infatuation with the things of this material world. <laughs> so this is not coming from one's past karma. It is due to the Lord. Like that. So this is the other kind of uh, tolerance. Um, the first kind of tolerance everyone gets. <laughs> The, the, the difficulties that come from environmental uh, calamities, just like we got the COVID now, so somewhat of an environmental calamity, you know, we have to tolerate it. The invisible enemy, we can't see it, but we know it's there. So what can we do? We take precautions and we tolerate what we have to do in order to uh, stay free from the effects of the virus. So here, these are two types of tolerances. And the second one is very important to understand for the devotee because this is how the devotee brings, this is how Krishna brings his devotee closer to him. To him. Okay. Now, there's another kind of tolerance we can talk about which is actually part of the first kind of, and that is called Adi Bautika. We just spoke about Adi Daivika. Adi Daivika means um, miseries come by higher powers. Now we have Adi Bautika, miseries come 
do those 15 minutes, all right? And that was due to other living entities. You're sitting peacefully in your room. You're in a nice warm and climate, but some mosquito comes and bites your leg. And now you have some discomfort and you can no longer sit peacefully. So miseries by other. Then there's there are snakes, there's dogs, there's other people who give you trouble. And this is another, this is called Audi Bautica. So learning to tolerate all these different things. So how do we tolerate other people who are somewhat of giving us disturbances? Maybe they are by nature disturbing and we haven't done anything to cause them to, to act in that way, but still that is their nature. They just, they are disturbing by nature. There are people like that. Even to find, we might even find certain persons who practice spiritual life may also have these tendencies. We have to see, well, um, Bhakti Siddhanta gives the formula. When somebody, someone is bothering you about something, but it's not specifically what it is. In other words, it's not a particular incident that happened or didn't happen. It's just the fact that we're in association with these people and they may be envious, they may be critical, they may be lusty, they may be just rude or they may be trying to control us. You know, there may be different things. Then Bhakti Siddhanta gives an interesting statement. He says, when other people's activities disturb you, look within yourself and see what is the cause of that disturbance. What is about you that is causing you to become disturbed? Is because what they're doing to you or is it because what they are as an individual and you cannot tolerate such persons? Of course, in a practical sense, we usually avoid such association. But when we can't avoid that association and we have to be in that environment, then we have to tolerate. <laughs> we have to tolerate. If you try to correct the situation, usually it becomes a, a point of contention, especially if you're dealing with grown-ups. If it's children, then you can take them and also uh, correct them because children require guidance and corrections when they're off. Children, I mean, children that are under the age of 14 years old. But uh, in general, we have to somehow or other learn that this tolerance, you know, we find ourselves in situations like, I'll give you an example. For those of us who travel in India, or those of us who lived in India, we know there can be a lot of inconveniences that arise simply by travel. These inconveniences come in so many different ways. Um, one of the things that I noticed, which is more contemporary, is that this infatuation with mobile phones, when it hit India, people went wild in order to capitalize on this new technological toy. And so people will use these, uh, they'll use their phones and they'll be in public places They'll be in public transports and they'll be speaking on the phone very loud, extremely loud to whoever they're talking to. And you can hear it without even, uh, without even uh, trying to hear. In fact, if you don't try to hear, you're not successful because it becomes so intrusive. I remember um, here's a little example which Srila Prabhupada gave us. 
when devotees were traveling with Srila Prabhupada on an airplane, this was back in the days when there was no smoking. There was smoking allowed in the airplane in a certain section of the airplane. After that, they, they cut it off completely, but they had the smoking section. So there were some passengers who were sitting in the non-smoking section along with where were Srila Prabhupada and his few disciples were. So the smoke was bothering the disciples. Prabhupada was just chanting. And uh, so the devotee called the stewardess and indicated that these people are not, they're in the non-smoking section and they're smoking. So the stewardess came on and she instructed those people to stop smoking if they're going to sit there. So they stopped. And then when she went away again, they began smoking. So the devotee again was going to complain and Prabhupada stopped him. Prabhupada looked at the devotee, his, his, his secretary or his servant said, the difference between them and us is that we have to learn to tolerate. We have to tolerate that. I remember, I mean, I've been in innumerable situations because I travel, I was traveling for years where there were been so many disturbances in public places by people who were completely oblivious and completely insensitive to the environment around them. I can name a dozen incidents. But then I always remembered what Prabhupada said, we have to learn to tolerate. And as soon as we begin the process of tolerance, when these disturbances, which come for no apparent reason, there's a reason of course, but there's no apparent reason. Um, we just take shelter of Krishna. We take shelter of the holy name. I remember one of my god brothers was telling me he traveled from Bombay all the way to to Calcutta by airplane, which is about two hours. And there was a baby just behind him and the baby was just crying the whole time. And nobody could pacify the baby. Everyone was coming, even the stewardess were trying to, and the baby just kept crying and crying and crying. So, <laughs> So my god brother, I remember he was talking to me, telling me about this, but he was making a point. You know, this is what we have to go through in order to preach, you know, so this is, this is the way it is. You never know what you're going to be faced with. And so we, we find that in our day to day life. Of course, we try to avoid situations that will provoke the reason to tolerate and we seek out situations that are pleasant. But many times it happens where we're put in that situation. So in that time we have to tolerate. One thing we should not tolerate is when people speak philosophical teachings that are contrary to Srila Prabhupada's presentation on Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada was very tolerant on the personal level, but when it came to um, any deviations in the philosophy, he was like Lord Nishringadev. He would not tolerate that and immediately correct it and correct the person also. So um, if something is against the process of devotional service and is being propagated as something good, then one may speak in such a way as to make a difference. In other words, in a corrective way, but not in a way that is offensive. If we speak from a disturbed state of mind, then we're no better than the people who are disturbing. We have to be free from that. I remember I had this situation, I'm using myself because I've had so many of these situations come up in my life and I find that, you know, Prabhupada's 
words always seem to resonate at the time when I need them. I remember one particular situation where I was defending a particular devotee who was being criticized by another devotee. So I was taking the part of defending that devotee and this devotee was coming at me like a, a locomotive and he was just finding fault with this person that I was trying to defend. And finally, he gave up because I didn't argue with him. I didn't get angry. I didn't do anything that was provoking on, from my side. I simply presented what I felt was right. And I did it in such a way that actually after a while, he started to listen to what I was saying. And then finally at the end, he apologized and said that he was actually wrong. Later on, he went to that person who he was criticizing and also apologized. So by remaining free from agitation, when there is cause for agitation, we can change the people who are agitated. We can change them because uh, that doesn't always work, but it is one of the ways by which people react positively. So we find ourselves in situations with other people and then we have to somehow learn how to tolerate without becoming offensive or without becoming, we may become a little disturbed, but not to the point where we lash out as a, as a reaction. I don't want to tell any more stories. I was just thinking of two more stories of, because when you travel on airplanes, when you travel in trains in India, when you travel in, when you're traveling, tolerance becomes your armor. You have to tolerate so much. If we create our own little tiny environment, we can somehow or other find a little bit of a less, a more peaceful situation when we create our own environment and stay within that environment. But when we go outside of that environment, we don't know what's going to happen and how the disturbances are going to come. And generally, they come. Okay, okay. so Lord Chaitanya is, is making a point in this verse that one has to tolerate like a tree. Using the example of a tree is a perfect example because out of all the living entities in creation, the tree is the epitome of tolerance. And as the Charya is described, the tree um, gives cooling shade to persons who sit under it in the hot summer and the hot sun hits the tree, but at the same time, the tree is giving shade to people underneath. Uh, people need wood for their cooking. People need wood for building. And sometimes the tree is cut down, the tree does not protest. Animals come into the tree. People come to pick the fruits from the tree, break branches off the tree, children try to climb on the tree. The tree is very, very tolerant. The tree is a living entity also. Its external awareness is not like ours but it still feels the tree, the tree can also perceive uh, light and it can also perceive um, pain to a slight degree. Mm -hmm. And this was proven by Jagadish Chandra Bose when he hooked up uh, plants to his machine and showed that plants react to certain external stimuli, stimuli accordingly. If the stimuli is negative, then the plant starts to diminish. If the stimuli is positive, the plant starts to grow. It's interesting. They've done tests. So yeah, so trees and plants 
they're living beings too. And they are also slightly, but not like us, affected by the stimuli that comes by way of environmental changes. Okay, so I'll stop there. It's a very, tolerance is one of them, probably the most uh, important quality for making progress in devotional service. Life in this material world depends on how tolerant you are. Everyone has to tolerate, even Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada made a very interesting statement in this regard. He said, let's see if I can find the exact quote. A great person, and the, the greatness of a person, the greatness of a person can, must be estimated by how much they are able to tolerate in provoking circumstances. Yeah, that's the quote. The greatness of a person is estimated by how much they're able to tolerate in provoking circumstances. So it's an interesting statement because one who has actually developed tolerance is considered to be, has developed the greatness of one of the most important qualities for practicing Krishna consciousness and just living in general. Okay, so any comments or questions? Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for this nectar on tolerance. As you mentioned, these are the fundamental qualities for our advancement in devotional service. So really good to understand on these qualities more and more. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Hare Krishna, dear devotees, if you have any questions or any comments, uh, you can unmute yourself uh, to ask these questions or uh, if you would like me to read, then you can uh, write this on the chat window. Thank you. Pranam Maharaj. My humble obeisances. All glory to Shri Prabhupada. All glory to you, Maharaj. Thank you for this uh, vital subject. And my question has always been on tolerance is um, how can we be tolerant uh, when our own moral compass can be different to others. And also, do we then need to compromise our morals in order to be tolerant? No, no. If you compromise your, your values, morals, or even spiritual principles in order to... Um, but you have to learn how to work with the situation at the same time, not compromise. <laughs> but generally, we we find we don't necess always find ourselves in that environment. That's usually something that comes up occasionally. But morality is the basis of spirituality. Without morality, there's no question of spirituality. And the moral principles that we adhere to are the four regative principles, no illicit sex, no intoxication, no meat eating, no gambling. If you take these four and you unpack them more, you'll find that within them, all the immoral qualities that exist are found within those four. Greed, lust, anger, envy, pride, illusion, fear. No, that would be you have a person will become respectable for what they believe and not by how much they compromise in order to fit into a situation. Even people who disagree with you, by maintaining your values, you gain respect.
And so the answer is a straight, emphatic no. Do not compromise your values in order to somehow or other pacify someone's wrong attitude. But you have to do it. You have to maintain, but yet at the same time, not um, become very proud of what you believe in. And therefore think yourself better than the other person or try to beat them over the head with spiritual and moral principles. Because um, sometimes when we, um, especially in this COVID situation, it feels that um, uh, it becomes survival of the fittest uh, to then get the injection and who will get it first. How do we, um, without judging others, why they're rushing for the injection, uh, remain morally correct and not judge? Because the first thing we start making assumptions of why someone should get it before others. I'm not even, I don't even, <laughs> you shouldn't get an injection at all. What the, so you, you asked the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> this vaccine is another form of control. That's all they're, they're using it to control you. That's. <laughs> It's a hard one, this one, on, on, uh, on morals, because um, everybody has a different um, idea on what's morally right. And well, we, as we, take the, we take the words coming from Srila Prabhupada and from the Acharyas, what is right. And if you're not sure, then you just inquiry, inquire. Mm. Mm -hmm. Does it then? Ranti, oh, Dave. Just... Ranti Dave was the king of the world and he decided to perform an austerity of fasting for one whole year. And after one year, after fasting, he, everything was ready for him to break the fast. It was a big feast prepared and he was there with his family. They also had fasted. So as soon as he was about ready to break the fast, uh, Mm. To, uh, a Brahmin came in and said, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Please give me some food. So Rati Dave gave food. <laughs> and then he left. And he was ready to now break the fast. And soon a Chandala came with all his dogs. And he said, my dogs are very hungry. Please help us. So he fed the Chandala and he fed the dog. And then... He was already to, and finally, another group of people came. Finally, he gave all the food away, and there was only water left. And then when it came to taking the water, this was the only thing that was left after fasting for a year. Another person came and said, oh, I'm very thirsty. Please give me some water or else I'm going to die. Rati Day was magnanimous personified. He couldn't tolerate anybody else's suffering. He would rather suffer than see anybody else suffer. So when it came to that, he gave away the water, there was nothing left. He had given everything away. And finally, the Chandala, the dogs, everyone came back and they were actually demigods in disguise. They took these forms just to test Ranti Dave to, see, to show the glories of this personality that was he was willing to sacrifice everything in order to help another. So a, Vaisha, a Vaishnava is, is like that. A Vaishnava will somehow or other undergo some difficulty in order for other people to benefit. Because we know these, these difficulties are not so bad, but for materialists, the difficulties become 
destroys their whole life. For devotees, we can tolerate some difficulties. We have to tolerate. Sometimes, you know, you're all ready for lunch and the food doesn't taste good. <laughs> I remember, <laughs> I remember when I was in one place, I won't mention the place. And it was a festival. It was a Kirtan festival for four days. So none of, none of the people who, who were cooking for me knew what I liked. So they were cooking for me every day. And every day they were giving me things I couldn't eat or I didn't like. So <laughs> I, so I, I tolerated the first day, the second day, the third day, and then the fourth day I said, that's it. They got to get it right today or else I'm going somewhere else to find something to eat. So they all said, all right, Maharaj, you know, we got it down. We got better cooks now. They all know. <laughs> so again, the fourth day was just as bad as the first three days. <laughs> and then I understood, Krishna, you're just teaching me. <laughs> Thank you for teaching me that one should not be, you know, one should be satisfied for whatever comes by way of natural arrangement. It's the way the world is. You can get what you want sometimes and you cannot get what you want sometimes. You can get what you don't want sometimes. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Complain, cry, throw things? Tolerance is, is one of the most exalted of all qualities. We're speaking so everyone can understand what this verse is about. I'm not presenting myself as someone who was on that level. I'm presenting myself, I'm presenting what I know from my own experience based on what is being said in this verse. One has to practice tolerance. That's the way the world is. Two things are required in this world that you have to practice. If you don't, you can't live. And that is tolerance and patience. These two things are fundamental to live, to life. To be patient, to be tolerant. And you also have to know when not to be tolerant also. That's another feature of being tolerant. There's, an, there's a story where one great philanthropist, moralist, also practicing spiritualist, um, someone came up to him and started really, really, really like, Criticize him. He remained completely calm, didn't say anything. And uh, after a while, the person left. So another person was observing with that. So when uh, this other person came up to him, he said, Wow, that man was so angry and he was saying so many things. You were so tolerant, so peaceful. How did you do that? And he said something interesting, something that was really, he said, when someone wants to give you something and you don't take it, they have to keep it. People want to give us negativity, just don't take it. Remain in your position. That's all. I'll give you another example, which is kind of a different example. There was one man who claimed to be uh, very nonviolent 
and he practiced, preached nonviolence. So he would always speak that, you know, I will never become violent in any situation. This is the reverse now. This is the message is reversed. So one man, reporter, who was a reporter, was going to test him. And he knew that this man had a daughter. So the, the reporter said, my dear sir, um, if someone comes to violate your daughter, will you do anything to stop them? And the man who was this, you know, glorifiable uh, peace pro protagonist, he said, I will not become violent under any circumstance. And the reporter kept pushing, but if someone comes to cause harm to your daughter, and then he continued with his same line, I will not be. And then the reporter said, my dear sir, you are violent. Because when you fail to protect someone who needs protection in the name of not doing anything, that's another form of violence. Well, what is you know, Prabhupada actually says, it says that. I, it's interesting, he says, um, go to um, uh, Vivek. Yes, Guru Maharaj. This is, worth, this is worth putting up. Go to Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Uh, 13th chapter. Yeah. Verses 8 through 12. Okay, now go into the purport. You have to go into the purport now. This is a long purport, very long. We're going to come to the point of, let me see, uh, what is it? Uh, okay, keep going. We're, kind of, we're coming to the point of nonviolence. There will be a section describing nonviolence. Here it is. Here we go, here we go, right there. Nonviolence is generally taken to mean not killing or destroying the body. But actual nonviolence means to not put others in distress. People in general are tapped by ignorance in the material concept of life and they perpetually suffer pains. So unless one elevates people to spiritual knowledge, one is practicing violence. Whoa. One should try his best to distribute real knowledge to the people so that they may become enlightened and leave this material entanglement. That is nonviolence. So to allow people to suffer when you can make a difference and you're in a position, you're actually contributing to their suffering. Interesting. So Prabhupada gets right to right to the essence of these qualities and not minces words in order to patronize people's feelings. <laughs> next paragraph. Someone read the next paragraph. <laughs> Tolerance. Should I read Guru Maharaj? Yeah. Tolerance means that one should be practiced to bear insult and dishonor from others. If one is engaged in the advancement of spiritual knowledge, there will be so many insults and much dishonor from others. This is expected because material nature is so constituted. Even a boy like Prahlad, who only five years old, was engaged in the cultivation of spiritual knowledge, was endangered when his father became enter agonistic to his devotion. The father tried to kill him in so many ways, but Prahlad tolerated him. 
so there may be many impediments to making advancement in spiritual knowledge but we should be tolerant and continue our progress with determination hari krishna okay that kind of sums up everything that statement any other questions comments Yes, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Sri La Prabhupada. All glory to you, Maharaj. Maharaj, in relation to uh, the the purport and uh, the discussions on uh, where uh, to be tolerant, you mentioned a point that uh, if a wrong philosophy is presented, then we should not be tolerant, and we should, in a right way, present the right uh, philosophy or the right message. Uh, and we see that maharaj uh, sometimes when you do preaching or even institutionally you are uh, for example is interfaith forums uh, that has uh, that, that goes on um, and it, uh, and if you are we see that sometimes devotees are invited to those forums and then on those forums you see sometimes bogus gurus and person presenting their own mental concocted philosophies and i always kind of wonder should we you know those devotees or or should we if you are put in a similar situation on a personal level be uh, very proactive to present the right philosophy because you know i'm thinking in my limited uh, view if you don't then we are accepting what is being said That's well true. in if you're talking about interfaith forums then that's a whole different thing you can expect that and therefore you if you get involved with that I did interfaith preaching for many years in Chicago during the 1990s and we found ourselves in these situations but we just stuck to our principles without criticizing others and at the same time looking for ways to connect with other people that on ba- on the basis of things that were similar but that was a certain strategy we used but uh because otherwise to challenge that means you were out of the whole loop because you came together based on these different so but we did and you know, we we had i've been i've been in many of these situations with my bodies and others and in many times we had to speak out in these situations but uh, in general um if you're speaking one to one with a friend or just someone as an acquaintance uh you can't just ex- for the sake of being friendly you can't just allow people to speak something that is what we say not right and you have to present it and correct it in a very uh, gentlemanly way and i use that word gentlemanly in a way that you respect the person but you don't agree and you make yourself vocal about what you disagree you don't lose respect for the individual because if you do then everything gravitates down to a personal thing you attack the philosophy and not the person okay ma but that is also difficult it's also difficult these days because people wear their philosophy like they wear their personality what you have to use your intelligence to see how to do that okay ma thank you and uh, maharaj just uh, uh, another question i think we touched based on that one but just a specific uh, comment on my side or a question so we have to be tolerant uh, so that is the message uh, now if we are put in a situation where you have to go and speak to someone about something that is wrong that you feel in your sort of you know as mataji was saying the moral standards but if you feel that that is something wrong uh, either been done to you or done to others then should you still be tolerant or you should approach it uh, in a way that uh, can uh, facilitate a discussion it depends on your position in relationship to the other people <laughs> a guru has to correct disciples a parent has to correct children teacher has to correct the students they're in a position to correct 
And so that's expected. But if you're not in a position and you put yourself in that position just because you want to correct, then you might find yourself just inflaming the situation. Therefore, generally, when we look for solutions that are according to the circumstance. For instance, I'll give you an example. If some senior devotee is doing something that is off and it becomes obvious, do you go and correct them? Better not, because you may also commit an offense. Better to talk to someone who is his peer and explain the situation and then ask them to make a difference. So rectifying a situation doesn't always mean entering into the situation. It depends, you have to use your intelligence because there are so many dynamics and there's so many situations and there's so many mentalities. And you have to see how best, just like Srila Prabhupada. I may give you an example, Srila Prabhupada was giving a lecture in an auditorium with many students. He was talking about first class men, the Brahmins. So after he spoke, one student got up and said, my dear sir, you think you are first class. And then he went on to say a few other critical words. Prabhupada stopped and then he remained silent. He said, actually, I'm not first class. I'm not second class. I'm not third class. I'm not fourth class. I'm fifth class because I'm servant of the other four classes. When the boy heard that, the boy became pacified. His home mood changed and everybody in the audience also saw. And when, when the boy was, when Prabhupada was speaking, Prabhupada was showing emotion because he was feeling, yes, I'm low. I'm not, I'm actually not like, the, I'm actually, you know, not first class. I'm just servant of those who are the higher classes. Then that's Prabhupada's natural humility. So in that situation, he acted like that. In other situations, when uh, Someone got up and said, I am God. And Prabhupada said, you are not G-O-D or D-O-G or dog, so sit down. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to you see, if you, if you observe how Prabhupada did things in different situations, you'll see he you know, not always acted in the same way. He acted according to the situation. We have to learn that art. I'm giving you a general answer because I basically I'm telling I'm trying to inspire you to use your intelligence to determine the situation before you actually enter into it or don't enter into it either one. If it involves you directly and you're already in it, then you have to use your intelligence to see how to make a difference. It comes back to intelligence all the time. If we allow emotions to overshadow our intelligence, then we somehow rather may cause more damage. So this idea of not, pridelessness means if somebody criticizes us, we don't care. They can say whatever they want. I, when I was a kid, you know, I'm still a kid, but anyway, when I was a kid, <laughs> we used to say these little things, sticks and stones can break your bones, but names can never hurt you. But when people's words are sharp and sometimes they go right to the heart and they cause this great pain. So the closer, this is interesting, this is in the Bhagavatam, the closer someone is to you and that person causes you some pain, 
that pain is sharper than done by someone who is not close to you, who is a, a stranger or even someone who um, you may, who may present themselves as your enemy. That's why when it comes to family members, it becomes very, very sensitive how we treat each other because the closeness, the relationship is so uh, intimate that when we hurt each other, it really hurts a lot. It hurts much more than when we are, when people are not so close. Thank you, Maharaj. That helps. And uh, yes, uh, we will use the intelligence, as you said. Uh, thank you very much, Maharaj, for the, some guiding points. Very thank valuable. You. I, hope, thank you. I hope I didn't over answer your question. No, no, this was, this was good, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. So, Maharaj, we are nine minutes over the hour. Should we take last question or should we close, Maharaj? We can close because at, uh, in less than one hour, there is a special uh, presentation by His Holiness Radhana Swami on lessons from the coronavirus, which is coming up on the Zoom. I sent the, uh, the link out to the to the conference and people can pick it up. So it's at um, it's at 7:30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, which is three o'clock. Uh, let's see, no, which is um, two o'clock uh, UK time, which is less than an hour from now. Yeah. So I'm, yeah. So I recommend the devotees, if you can you'll get a lot good insight on a lot of things. So someone can share it on the WhatsApp group. Whoever's available, maybe Silpa can share it on the WhatsApp group. Or Lavanya. Sri Devi, either one, Tushar. Okay, so we'll stop here and thank you very much. And tomorrow we'll continue with this verse again and going into the last two principles that are mentioned. Characteristics. All glories to his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you very much Guru Maharaj for giving your time and association. Thank you devotee for joining this session. Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Guru Dev ki jai, Krishna, thank you. Parant Kuti Vishnu Brind ki jai. Jai. Thank you. Krishna, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Guru Maharaj. This was wonderful. Thank you, Maharaj. Praise the Prabhupada. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna.